So Ron, today we are going to talk about Robert Hartman and the work that he's left behind, why you um, consider his work to be important, that you want to include it in the training work that you do. So tell me about Robert Hartman. Who is he and why is his work important? Robert Hartman is, in my opinion, one of the uh, least well-known thinkers of the 20th century. So he was born in 1910 and he died in 1973. And in that, in his lifetime, he lived through a lot of uh, momentous events that uh, really define the 20th century. And he wrestled with some really, really big questions. And I mean, that in itself would be kind of interesting as a side note or as a footnote. But the fact that he actually found answers to these big questions and then was very prolific in sharing them and got quite a, an interest in a following in his day uh, makes him worth paying attention to. So what have you discovered the value of reading his work for you? Hartman's works aren't like, you know, bedtime reading or something that, you know, just anyone's going to, you know, grab hold of. But the the kernel, the, the, the core idea is pretty simple. So simple that you may even overlook it and say, oh, okay. Anything else? What's next? Tell me what is something that is so simple that I may overlook or you have overlooked and then you have to look at it again and consider it. I, I definitely have overlooked it. Um, I know for myself and when I think about good or what is goodness, um, I still have trouble uh, implementing his ideas, but I find them very um, far reaching and captivating. What Hartman came up with in 1949, when he had this, his aha, his, his epiphany, was he said, good is not a quality. Good or goodness is when something completely fulfills its concept. So as an example, if we were to think about a car, first we have to say, what is what makes a car a car? It has to be able to get us around it has to be a good means of transport. Um, it should look good. It should, you know, not use up too much energy. So whatever makes a car a good car, well, if you just stop and think about it, what what makes a, ba a bad car? <laughs> well, it's got two wheels off of it. Its engine doesn't work, won't take you anywhere. Well, that's a bad car, obviously. So the best car that you could imagine is like it fulfills all the possible qualities of cardness of, of what makes a good of a car. And, you know, Hartman said you can apply that to any possible entity, any thing in the world. What makes a good person good? What makes a good philosophy good? It fulfills all of its concepts of what should be there, of what we expect of it. And what do you say? What makes a good human then? That has an interesting answer because if you, the answer depends on each individual because each person has this tremendous potential within them for all kinds of value and goodness. And so in, in one sense, the answer to that question is a good person is someone who is fully realizing their potential. 
Do you agree? Yeah, I do. I do. So um, I think what makes this what makes this good is if we take all of the possibility that we hold, all the talent, all the you know good things that we've been given, all the opportunities, and we realize them, we make them something that are expressed more fully in the world. About 20 something years ago, when I first started in the coaching field, I remember uh, one of the mentor coaches that I have um, had this line, to live from your highest and your noblest good. And I really liked that line. And it set me off on a path to discover what is my noblest good and what is my highest good. Around the time that Hartman was still wrestling with this question of what is good, and before he had a complete answer, he had he had some ideas already formulating. And so in the 1940s, even as a university professor in Ohio, he um, made it his business, if you will, to make friends of businessmen, people who were leaders in American industry, and he tried to influence them to give more thought to how their companies and these large corporations that they were leaders of, how they could add more value to the lives of the people that they touched, specifically the employees who worked in these companies. And Hartman led the charge of uh, something called profit sharing and worked with leaders of these other American companies to say, you know, employees are going to have more fulfillment in their jobs and they're going to contribute more to the company if they have a stake in the company, if they have some sense of ownership. And so you should find ways to share your profits with your employees, which was a revolutionary idea in the 1940s. He began this whole movement that, that, that in the United States um, today, it's become like a, a regular expected thing that every decent company of any size is going to do some amount of profit sharing with their employees through something called a, a 401k program, okay. where they make contributions to the, to the employees a retirement fund that's separate and apart from the one organized by the government, which we call Social Security in the United States. Today, that's just taken for granted. But in the 1940s, it was revolutionary. Robert Hartman said, how do we get, this is, again, the question, how do we organize for good? He said, we'll get more good out of taking profits and not just holding them in the hands of a few at the top, the shareholders but sharing the profits more with the employees and getting a wider base and a sense of ownership. And he called that an intrinsic connection to the mission of the organization. That's just one small indication of how he was trying to organize for good. I had no idea that he was so instrumental in the 401k. Um, my, so, that is really interesting. Like, if I'm interested in the work, like, how does Lead Skill and you walk through, you know, walk me through a process that I could use for my own personal investigation and reflection? If it, it, it at the time it almost seemed like an afterthought, but Hartman in the in the early 1960s um, said, you know we can actually uh, take a picture, not a like a photographic picture, but we can take a picture of a person's um, whole value system, how they, how they choose to value different things. If they will just take a few minutes to answer um, a couple of questions. And he put together this sort of a profile or survey called the Hartman Value Profile. He and another... Uh, gentleman in Mexico, Mario uh, Cardenas, they together came up with this profile that you just spend five, 10 minutes ordering a couple of items, 
it's you know two different exercises. You order a list of 18 items, and it will give you a snapshot of how you see the world and how you see yourself in terms of value categories. And we at Leeds go use a version of that profile. We use um, a modernized form of it called the Acumen Capacity Index to help people that we work with get a hold on how they see good and how they see bad and whether they see well <laughs> or don't see so well, all the different dimensions of goodness and badness and you know value in their in their job, in their organization, in their families, in their community. And um, that that's one of the inputs that we use in our coaching with people. Are there certain uh, goals that we are to work toward? So the the profile, the Hartman Value Profile itself doesn't tell you what goals you should work toward. Um, just like this pair of glasses I've got, they don't really tell me what to look at or where to look. But anywhere that I point them, they make things clearer and they oh. help me see and read, yes. you know, things in much greater detail and much, you know, it takes the fuzziness out of yes. my own failing vision. And the Hartman Value Profile is much like that. It doesn't tell you what to believe, what to think, what to spend time on, but it points out where you have blind spots and where you might have some distortions and or where you are very clear and where your emotions and your biases are not disturbing or interrupting anything. And therefore you can trust your instincts. And so I guess the point of all that is that each one of us have a lot of potential within us, goodness that we can bring out in the world. But each one of us also has things that get in the way, stumbling blocks or blind spots. And if there's anyone who can help us with those, that kind of help is very welcome. And I think everyone could benefit from working with you know, someone else as a coach, even if you don't formally uh, engage in that or you know, pay someone as a coach. But I mean, everyone needs a mentor. Everyone needs a teacher and several teachers in life not just to teach us knowledge, but also to teach us wisdom and to, to listen to us as we are trying to work through, you know, the questions that, that are engaging us every day. I think mean, good coach or consultant or expert as always on a path of um, learning something new. And so I'm curious, um, if I were to be involved or take this test, uh, like you said, it helps me see better my blind spots, right? So you said you said that this test takes no more than 10 minutes to complete. Um, mm -hmm. Is it because it, he spent years and years refining the tool to such a level where, you know, it, it's just so quick and fast and we can get such uh, sound and stout data? He didn't spend years and years perfecting this, but he did spend years and years trying to understand things like higher mathematics, things like set theory. He did a doctoral dissertation on uh, whether set theory could be applied to the whole realm of value science. Um, he spent time trying to understand the internal logic structure of you know value. And based on all that work, when he set his mind down to coming up with some sort of a profile that would put, you know, things in an axiological order, I think the actual work on that didn't take a lot of time. And I think it's a, it's a pretty astounding accomplishment. When you have the tool, you're able to see more clearly the areas where you are not so strong in and what uh, you are strong in from this uh, information, that from this acumen capacity. Is that correct? And once yeah. you have, yeah. So 
what I'm hearing from you is that this tool provides um, me a window into uh, considering some of my own perspectives and how sharp they are and where the areas where I need to also still consider and become more self-aware of. It's almost like Hartman gave us the map of the territory without going and exploring the whole world. And, you know, it, it sounds like an incredible achievement. It's like we would expect someone who's going to map the whole world, they have to go travel to all parts of the world so that they can make an accurate map. Yes. Hartman gave us a map of kind of the value terrain without having to explore all possible combinations of value. It's kind of a it's an intriguing thing that he's done. Is that why you use this tool to help you in your um, business? Because it keeps me looking at the things that are really important. And in the world of management, there's a lot of fads. There's a lot of, um, you know, the latest and the greatest kind of what, what's hot now, just like in the market, the market, you know, there's a lot of trends. And I think you've seen this for yourself as an example in the fashion industry, you know, things go in a trends and even beyond kind of the, the, the fad or the trend or the fashion of the moment, there are some things that are classic. There's mm -hmm. some things that stand the test of time. And, you know, when we start taking apart all kinds of things, like fashion, like art, like, you know, the market trends or business studies or, you know, what makes a good worker? What makes a good company? Is Apple or Samsung better at making a smartphone? Which product has a, a deeper intrinsic connection to the customers so that they stay loyal and they keep wanting to buy it generation after generation? You know, these sort of things are real. And if you have a handle on that, if you have a way of actually quantifying this, you have something pretty powerful. And in my experience, I found that formal axiology and what Robert Hartman gave to us has the goods. It can actually deliver this. It's a tool that has multiple uses in looking in all these different areas. I, I come away with... Um, uh, better awareness and understanding of just the, that there is a really a big body of, of knowledge that Hartman brings to the world and and why uh, you um, endorse it. Is there any other work that you are currently working on, this project that you're pursuing in this field? So besides using the Hartman Value Profile for helping individuals develop themselves and realize their fuller potential. Um, some of the concepts of formal axiology can be used for businesses. And so in my work with leaders, we can actually look into things like um, the structure and the, the design of a business or an organization. Is, it, is the organization helping the people, the main stakeholders, have a fuller, richer life. And we can we can look at that in terms of, is it de delivering to the customers what they expect of it? Is it delivering to the employees what they expect of it? Is it delivering to the community? And the larger community, if you think about companies, sustainability is a big issue these days. Like what is the net impact or cost to the environment of a business's operations? Are they, you know, polluting the environment? Are they just churning out a bunch of junk that is, you know, depleting our resources? Or are they doing a smart job of recycling or making things, you know, in a way that is sustainable for the long term? You can apply all of these concepts. Formal axiology helps us to understand these things about businesses and design better businesses, better organizations. And so bringing some of these ideas to leaders so that they can think more holistically and think in different dimensions is part of my work too, that I really want to share with more leaders so that they have this as working distinctions in their own toolkit. Besides the working definition of what good is, as you said, 
Parmung was able to clearly define. I'm interested to know are there gradations of good? Um, and if they, they aren't, then so what is what is considered good? Yeah, anyone who thinks that this is just an abstract sort of um, field for just philosophers, that only philosophers care about it, I would challenge them to see if they can make it through a single day of life without using the concept of good on a functional level. I probably have to unpack that a little bit for me so that I can like, because today is a Saturday when I'm recording this. So I am trying to understand, I have laundry that I've just finished spinning. So, right. um, and I probably need to go to the grocery store to pick up the week's grocery. So, so I'll give you a real quick uh, <laughs> walk through this just to, you know, when you go to the laundry, you're probably going to check and see if your clothes got dried. Did the dryer do a good job of drying the clothes or are they still wet? So did it fulfill your concept of what the laundry being done is? Because yes. if you take the clothes out and they're still damp and you just put them in the drawer, then you're gonna have in a few days mildew, right? Or you're gonna have damp clothes that, and it's not, you know, it's not fulfilling its concept of goodness. And once you go to the grocery store, you're going to be looking for food. And in the produce section specifically, you're going to be checking on whether things are firm or whether they have dark spots or whether it's spoiled already. Is it good or not good? That's right. You're going to check the dates to see if something is going to expire tomorrow or did it already expire last year and someone kept it on the shelf way too long? Is it still good? You can't it's function a single day of your life without dealing with a concept of goodness. I and realize this is a that. Saturday. Mm -hmm. Yes, for I realize you. that. Yeah, even with uh, you know the news media, it's a twenty four seven cycle that you can just you know go to any platform, click on any device, and you can have any information coming into your life. And you have to decide what is good information that you will consume and what is stuff that you need to keep at bay and not have any conversation with or any give any attention to. So I can see, I never thought of like having to, uh, this functionality of good as an essential, that is like sort of like a humming in my background that I'm not even aware of. Like a one, iOS. Sec <laughs> one second after you wake up in the morning, you're already asking the question about goodness because you're asking the question, is this going to be a good day? Do I feel good right now? Do I feel good enough to get up? I usually look at how do I make it a good day? <laughs> exactly, exactly. And at the end of the day, we're asking ourselves, was it a good day or not? Reflection time, yes. And then, yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's interesting when I asked you the question, yes, we could actually multiply, besides good and bad, we could say good, very good. We could say average, fair, so-so, not so good, poor, extremely poor, very, very bad, awful, terrible. I mean, there's a whole range of, you know, gradations that we can make between good and bad. Mm -hmm. And in fact, those are functional distinctions that we make every day. We walk by something and we smell a terrible smell and say, oh, that's awful. You know, it's not a good smell. Because we were expecting sweetness, right? And something that's, you know, pleasant. So it's it's a fun thing to play with, but also it's a serious thing. Just like I started on a very serious note talking about the impact of policies and government and history and whether we, you know, are our leaders making good decisions? You know, are they creating conditions of peace and create, you know, conditions of flourishing in society? Or are they setting one group against another? And are we having like misery and hunger and fighting and war? So, you know, these things occur on huge, big societal level and they occur on little, we call minute, you know, small daily level. It's a part of everyday life. Yeah, I see that. Amazing. Yeah, so thank you for anything else before we conclude this conversation. I mean, um, I think that's enough for now, but uh, I'm I'm thankful for anyone watching this still that you've you know stuck around with us to you know think with us, and I would really welcome your engagement. Let us know how this was helpful for you, and if 
you think that we might be able to help you in some way through the work that my company does, Lead Skill. If you have a company or if you work in a company where you think, man, we could use some better thinking about goodness and what makes us a good company or it's not a good company. We want to make it better. Um, we'd love to talk with you about how we can work with you on that. 